should not laugh here, you know? It's, yeah. This is how you look like on a regular Sunday, right? Um, when I started in the industry, websites looked like that. Um, everyone hated JavaScript. Cats already dominated the internet, we see it. And I wouldn't have thought that I would ever, ever work in this whole JavaScript space in 2016, really, seriously. But JavaScript got big for some reason, and now I'm working for Dynatrace. Uh, we do performance management, so I'm working with customers, as you see here, like Intuit or PayPal, and there are some customers I'm not allowed to talk about, and I don't know. I was hungry. And I see Node.js really a lot meanwhile. So, for instance, PayPal now hires around 1,000 developers around Austin, Node.js developers. So it's really huge. When I started at Dynatrace, it was like, yeah, this JavaScript thingy, we need someone that deals with that, and now I'm really dealing with many customers. I'm doing the uh, technical lead for Node.js development. This means that I work with the developers, with customers, and see what we can do on the Node space to make better monitoring for that. Um, and that leads us directly into our topic. It's uh, welcome to Modo, uh, hunting performance problems in Node.js, because it's not so easy um, to find, uh, to uh, uh, trace down problems in Node.js because Node.js is relatively young. Uh, Node.js, so as I see it, usually, is a tool of change. This means uh, it's what company outlaws use to do something new in their company, like Bruno, for instance. So fi they find out that it's great to create microservices uh, uh, with Node.js, for instance. So some brave people start this quest to build something new. In reality, they mo look more like that. Uh, that's, for instance, Alex Balash of Intuit. So he called this Node initiative really a, a pirate ship. What they did is really they worked after hours to uh, create TurboTax. So it was really a kind of a guerrilla team that started to use Node.js, and then it grew into the whole company. Or uh, Trevor Livingston of PayPal. So they had the problem that to change something on the Node.js front page, it took so just a text, something, yeah, a string was to change, and it took six months to get this done. And they thought, OK, that's not how it should work uh, in, a modern in a modern company. And so they started to use Node.js just as templating engine. And then it grew and grew. And as I said, 1,000 developers in the Node space in Austin now. Uh, and Aaron Hammer, at this time now, he is at Neoform, as far as I know. Um, still, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, at this time, he worked uh, at Walmart. So Walmart big company, many legacy stuff in there. And he used Node.js to transform this infrastructure, so to do digital transformation. So this is how companies usually use Node.js. So you have this old stack, some legacy stack, something, so you don't build usually, you, you usually, when you are not, not a startup, you don't build everything from scratch. So you put Node.js in front, as we see it here. Um, and that's great. And this could be also a microservice infrastructure. So this can be many, many node, node processes, for instance. Um, and everything works fine until maybe this EC2 thingy uh, starts to break. Or Tomcat has a problem. Uh, even the mainframe, maybe. Some database is broken. And in all of those cases, Node.js will be now the single point of failure. This is where you see the problem, actually. And you really see it 
in a way that really Node.js, for instance, starts to error out. Because, for instance, if a service you talked with uh, from Node.js, like a REST service, you use HTTP to talk with it, starts to get slow, those requests start to pile up on the event loop. You get something that's called back pressure, and you re really see non-deterministic behavior within Node.js. But actually, <laughs> It's not, the no, not Node.js fault, but still, how to prove that. Very soon, it may be like that. So you are the Node.js guy, and now everyone says, yeah, Node.js was what the company hipsters brought in just to break everything. So everything worked before. Now this new stuff comes, this JavaScript shit, and nothing works anymore. So and then you are this guy, maybe trying to fix things in production. You don't have a clue what's going on, but you have to fix it. And I think we need some kind of proactive defense here. Um, and to understand everything that deals with Node.js, and I think it was great that Matteo did this talk today because he uh, talked about um, really um, performance optimizations in development. And now I'm talking a little bit more about performance monitoring in production. And I recapitulate this uh, Node.js uh, topic, so what Node.js is, the basics a little bit. So Node.js is nothing else than a C++ program controlled by V8 JavaScript. So we have the V8 engine. We uh, have it in Google Chrome as well, and this thing it's just an engine where you throw JavaScript code into it, and it spits out something like that, really machinery code, not bytecode li like you see it in Java, no CLR, anything. It's really machinery code that runs then on your CPU. Uh, and every time a program is running, it's somehow represented through two things, something going on on the CPU and something stored in memory makes sense. And when we look uh, at performance problems in, in Node.js, we should maybe focus on these things first. So let's hunt some memory problems. The, the memory management in Node.js is very similar to every other platform we know. So we have this uh, resident set here. Uh, this is the whole memory allocated by Node.js. So this is what Node.js uses. Then we have the code segment. This is your JavaScript code. Then we have a stack where every, all local variables and everything is stored. Then we have a heap space allocated. And within that, we have the used, used heap. And inside the heap, we have all those objects, closures, all the, those dynamic structures. And you very easily, you can get this information out of Node.js. You just have to do a process memory usage here and it will spit up, out something like that. So here, again, you have the resident set size, the total heap, and the heap used. And every time I can have a cheap way to get metrics out of my application, I feel tempted to create some chart of, out of that. And this is what I did in this case. And here we have it again. So this is a running node application. Resident set. Um, heap total, and this is the used heap, and here we already see that this is a very volatile sawtooth pattern in some way. So we see that memory is constantly allocated and deallocated and allocated again. And there is a mechanism that does this usually, and it's called garbage collection. You said GC, right? Yeah, okay. Garbage collection. So this is an Austrian garbage collector. Um, fine. We have a happy end here, because we have a garbage collector that deals with memory. Everything is good. We don't have any problems, because, yeah, when memory is used in my application, it's deallocated again. So something takes care about that. Great. Unfortunately not, because there are problems every time we are dealing with, with garbage collection. And to understand this better, we have to visit my hometown. That's Linz in Austria. Um, and that's my house. So that's my house. And here is my backyard. And there we have 
everyone is wondering what, what I'm going to tell now, but it makes sense. Um, here is this one room where we store our garbage. And there we have this one thing that is there since I live in this flat. And there is a text on it uh, that says, um, bitte nicht hier abstellen und gleich selbst entsorgen, which means we won't put this away, it will stay here forever. And if this happens in your application, you will see something like this, and we call it memory leak, right? So Node.js will die, or the process will die some dramatic death, and then will spit out how it died, and that's that. So, and this is then where you maybe will spend your weekend, because you just have to find somehow where this problem is coming to, right? And I think to understand how such a memory leak works, we should build one, maybe. So let's build a memory leak here. Um, you can do it quite easily, so there is the easy way. You uh, declare a global variable, for instance, and there you, st like, let it be an array, and there you store the IP addresses of every user that, you, uh, that accesses your website in there. So then you have built a memory leak, but that's way too simple because, because that's obvious, right? Um, I found an example, and I always show it because it's so nifty and, and so complicated, but I show you a little bit more than a graphical representation of that. Because what do we have here? Uh, we have an express route that calls this replace thing. And this is our replace thing. And we see that there is some object in there which really allocates a really long string. Um, this um, object is referenced in the global root namespace. So it's in, in global scope, model global scope, and then we have some references going on, and here, that's the important thing, we have an unused function. So this function is never called, but it also references this original thing with, with, which references back to the thing which is that. So something with some interactions, but we should assume that every time this uh, route is called, it should actually create just the new the thing, but the old the thing variable should be discarded, right? Because, yeah, we don't append anything. We just create it every time, every, with every run we recreate it new, and just override this variable here. One should think so. What really happens, so, um, in your application this would look like that. So you have this root namespace, and then you have this the thing object, and then the thing points back to this root namespace, and we have this unused function, and there we have something called closure com context. This method within the thing uh, has to know its, its context. This is how closures work, and so it, it re maintains a reference to this unused function. And this unused function has original thing in there, which again maintains a reference to the thing. And that's totally legit code, totally. So there is nothing wrong with that. The problem is that the garbage collector V8 just bails out at this point. It's just too complicated for the garbage collector. At this point, maybe it will get better to resolve this uh, yeah, tree of interactions. And there, I would say, things get complicated, you know, because if, if, this, is, these are not, if this is not a real error you are dealing with, then you, it's, it's hard to find it, right? If this happens in your application, it will look somehow like that. So you will again see the used memory grow and grow, and at some point it hits the committed memory, and this is where you then have your uh, memory, uh, uh, out of memory exception in Node.js. So, I would say it would be great if we could look into our memory and really see what's going on inside there, right? And the nice thing in Node.js is that it actually builds on V8, as I said, and V8 ho has already functions built in to get those metrics out of the JavaScript engine. 
And you can use then some tools like V8 Profile, and there are a few of them around. Uh, that's a regular NPM module that just subscribes to this API the V8 engine all already provides. And there you can do, uh, yeah, profiler, take snapshot, and you get a snapshot. This is everything that's going on on your memory at this point in time. That's great, actually. What you have to do to make sense of, of, of the data you get out of that is you have to create more than one snapshot. So you really have to do it periodically to really see something, a progression going on, because one single snapshot won't help you much. But if you have that, and if you have a memory leak, and if you maybe build something like that into your code, because you can really run this in production when a problem occurs, then you get a set of memory dumps. And then you can load it into Chrome Developer Tools. Who knows Chrome Developer Tools? Yeah, almost everyone. So this is the same format. You get the same format out of that uh, as Chrome Developer Tools uses when you debug your JavaScript applications in your browser. And then you can do, uh, you can, for instance, here I have these three uh, memory dumps, and I just create a comparison of that. So you can select a comparison of different dumps, and then you see how things grow. Makes sense. And in this, in this case, we see our big string I had allocated in there. And then you see, OK, there is something wrong. This is how you find memory leaks. This, there is no other way. And the nice thing, and this is what I'm trying to convey, is that Node.js already has everything built in to get this information out of that. So let's something quit unexpectedly here. So good. Um, now we have memory uh, problems covered. Let's look at CPU problems. And I again uh, try to yeah, talk a little bit about the event loop. Matteo did, did this today day as well. And I just want to show you one simple deta detail here. So we have here an asynchronous function. And this runs um, on the main thread, thread and gets delegated to the event loop. And the event loop then takes care that this task is done. And when the task is done, it comes back with this callback function and will provide, in the best case, no error object but some data to you. And here you have the callback. Uh, and there you proceed with your code. Makes sense. This is how basically asynchronous functions work. And that's great unless, until someone has the great idea because he, he thinks Node.js is so super asynchronous that we can simply calculate Fibonacci in there. And if you do that, this main thread will block because in Node.js everything runs on, on the main thread. So everything, your code, runs on the main thread. So there is nothing asynchronous of, uh, on what, 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 of the code that you write. And then things get terribly slow, because uh, when the main thread is blocked, this application cannot take any more requests. So it will really stand, calculate Fibonacci, and when it's done, it can again start to uh, pro uh, process new requests. So that's a problem. And again, we have the possibility to do some profiling here. And what we are doing here is uh, CPU profiling. Again, we just subscribe to those uh, V8 um, uh, functionality we already have. And we do a start profiling and at some point a stop profiling. And we get some data file out of that. And we can again uh, load it into Chrome developer tools. I personally cannot make so much sense out of flame graphs unless the uh, new flame graphs thingy of, of Neoform, because that's quite great. I don't know if you have seen it uh, of, from Matteo today, so where we really can uh, drill into the flame graphs. But for me, flame graphs are always very hard to grasp. And that's the reason why I use uh, D3 for that. So D3 is a JavaScript library used for, for representing data in, in the browser. And I used the same data that, that was coming out of this, um, of this CPU profiling process uh, and did some experiments with that. So the first thing I was doing was I was testing Ex Express with it. Um, I found out that when you don't set 
So in Express, Express is a Node.js framework, and you usually set it to development or production when it runs. So in pro there is just a um, environment variable you would set and set it when you start the application. If you don't set this node environment, the application gets very, very slow. It's two thirds slower than when it runs in production mode. And then I drilled a little bit more into that and I found out that Express actually defaults to development in the mode if you don't set it to production, which may be a problem if you aren't aware of that and just let your application run with, without this environment setting. And I wanted to know what this thing is actually doing. So I created this uh, little sunburst charts. So that's again very easy. So you use the CPU profiling data, feed it into T3, and it creates this uh, kind of tree chart for you. And here we see already this is without uh, develop uh, with in without de in development mode actually, and this is in production mode. And you don't have to be a data scientist to see that there is much more going on here, right? And I found out that everything that deals with that here is actually uh, Jade compiling. Jade is a template en engine in Node.js, and it makes totally sense that Jade, when you are in development mode, recompiles your templates every time you request the, the site. Because when you're in development, you don't want to restart the whole process every time uh, you change anything. Um, but the problem here still is that's the default. So if you aren't aware of that, you really have a problem. But here we see already that using um, something like, like CPU profiling really gives you insights into what your process is actually doing here. Um, there was one problem that was kind of a flame war. It was called Node.js in Flames. Netflix had a problem with Node.js with the Express framework, and they created this blog post where they really complained that there is a problem with the Express framework, so they really had the request times going up all the time, and then really they had to restart the whole process to get this problem fixed again, and then the request time was growing again, and then they had to restart again. Yeah, you get the point. Um, the problem was they had a script that created routes, Express routes. And it did this automatically, and Netflix was assuming that this is, this is some kind of a map. This means that every time the same route comes in again, the one overrides the other one. In reality, it looks like that. You have your, your routing table of Express here, and here we see already if um, the same route comes in again, it gets simply appended. And now imagine you have a script that creates thousands and thousands of new routes, and this is the case at Netflix because they have a quite big infrastructure. And to find this one route, you actually have a complexity of, of, um, of, of n. Makes sense. So the longer it is and the later you, you, you get the result in the routing table, it really takes long because it has really to run through the whole routing table here. And that it's not a map makes sense because we already we, we also can have so-called um, um, regex routes. So you cannot use a, a map in some way to to catch that. So you have to create one big list of routes here. And this is what Netflix didn't know. And this is why they then blamed Express and Node.js for doing something wrong. And this was kind of a flame war in the community then, because no, yeah, actually they shouldn't ha should have just looked into the code and look uh, at how it is done in Express. Um, and I run this example. Um, so I did the same. I created uh, a script that creates I don't know a few thousand Express routes. And here we see this is actually, and we see it here, this is the regex running here. So these, these, all those little bars we see here, this is all blame, uh, this is all route resolving. And we see that I would say around two thirds of their application runtime now is used for 
resolving such a route. And if Netflix had done it like that, they would have been able to find this problem like that. So totally no problem. Also with flame shots, I think this is what they actually did in the end. But again, what they're trying to convey is uh, use the existing tools uh, the V8 engine provides to you, and you are really able to find problems within Node.js. But there are also existing tools you can use for that. Uh, there is, for instance, this node monitor. It's open source. You can use it. It will give you some metrics around Node.js. There is nSolid uh, by Node Source. It's an enterprise grade node version uh, that will also create, uh, give you some great dashboards like that. So it's built into the application. Uh, there's Upbeat, great uh, thing for getting metrics out of Node.js. There is Ruxit, um, again, metrics around Node.js. So there is, it's quite, there is quite a selection of tools you can use to find problems within Node.js. But what if Node.js is not really the source of the problem after all? This is what I showed before. What if something else is broken? So, and to understand, the whole problem space, we should maybe look a little bit at the history for the younger ones here, maybe. So everything kind of started here in 1980. We had these mainframes. And when something was broken, no problem, you went to the mainframe guy, and he was the one to blame when something was wrong. Uh, then all these Java things came. So then you had these Java applications that again talked maybe to the mainframe, and you had these desktop applications uh, where this Java application was running, and there it already got, got a little bit harder, right? Because you didn't know when something was breaking, maybe the mainframe had a problem, or maybe the Java application. Around 2000, we had all those funny websites, but they weren't really a problem because they weren't attached to any business uh, processes within a company. Uh, but a little bit later, we saw all those intranet applications where employees um, in a company used a browser-based application to fulfill some task. And again, this may maybe talked to the Java tier or maybe also to the mainframe. So there was, all, and, and there we already had more problems because yeah, maybe there is a problem on the, uh, in the browser application, maybe it's some um, uh, SharePoint thing, who knows. But now we are here. Now we have this mobile applications in front, we have single page web applications, HTML5, JavaScript we pull from various third parties, no one knows, we just, yeah, is the third party down? Who knows? So, is Amazon down where we just, or is Bootstrap down where we, where we are pulling our CSS classes? So, who knows that and who, is really to blame when something is, goes wrong here. So the number of stakeholders com constantly grew in such applications. And the problem is, these boundaries we see here are not just boundaries between um, physical applications or tiers. It's, it's boundaries between philosophies because the person that does this single page web applications has a totally different thinking than the person that works on the mainframe because it comes just naturally. It's, it's a generational thing and it's also a thing about which tools can I use, makes sense. And when you are the person that deals with this node tier, you should maybe protect yourself against these masses and on different, yeah, I, I don't know, um, these problems really on your border. And we need some kind of border control. I just had to do this in this for that. Um, and what could we do? So we want to know every time something uh, leaves uh, the boundary of my application, we want to know if this works or if this doesn't work, right? So we have this 
poor man's microservice thing here. So we are calling, we're using the request module to talk with some Java service here. And we want to kind of log what's going on. Did it work? Did it, didn't it work? So we have to actually do here some timing. Then we have to uh, get the duration of the call in the callback. Then when something goes wrong, we have to log out that something go went wrong here because, yeah, the callback came, came back, but something was wrong here. Um, there again, we have a problem because it was not the code 200. Yeah, and then we can finally log our success. And still, you just know in this case uh, that something was slow when you talked uh, with the other, with, with some background. You don't have any context here, but you have enough log data that you at least, you can at least prove that it was maybe not your fault. And now let's do this for every single tier. So every team in your, in your company creates its own monitoring solution. Totally great. It's so, and when, when something goes wrong, everyone can at least uh, yeah, kind of skip the blame game and say, no, or attend the blame game more, even more uh, by saying, okay, it's not my fault because I see there is something wrong here, so the other guys uh, have the problem and not me. But I think that's not how we should work, and that's why we need some kind of holistic view, because we are not an island. So you, in your application stack, is especially in enterprises, you really should always think about the, whole of the, uh, about the whole thing and not only about your tier here. And this is where actually application performance monitoring comes into place. And there are, again, a few tools from us, but also, uh, for instance, AppDynamics or New Relic. Uh, there are no non-commercial commercial tools, I have to say here, because it's so much uh, effort to create this instrumentation for every single, um, for, for every single technology. So no one, no open source project ever st started to try this. And if you use some performance monitoring tool, it will do something like that. So it will, it, can you see this even in the back? A little bit. So what it does, it, it creates, it, it really discovers which service is talking to which service, how do the, tra the transaction flow to, through your application, and it does this by really wrapping your code and really adding headers to every HTTP request and storing that and stitching this information together that you really know which uh, tiers and which services are talking to each other. And if there is a problem, you can then really see, okay, how this, did this problem develop after all, and which tiers were involved, and where did this problem start. And that's nice when it is like that. This is a real application, microservices. There it's not so easy anymore to see what is really affecting my application. And then if something goes wrong, let's look at the problem on analysis, like how did this problem build up? And it looks like that. You don't see it. It's, Im imagine a mushroom cloud, like at, when you have an atomic bomb. It's like that. So it's really the problem. It's a Docker application, so many Docker containers. And one starts to fa fail, and then everything starts to crumble, and everything goes down at, at some point. So this is. This is really hard to track. And that's why tools usually have some kind of anomaly detection and really show you then when something is wrong and show you in which tier something is going wrong. And so that you don't have to really drill into the whole, in, into, every, into every problem, but it will show you there was a problem and it was on this tier and this was the cause. We, it, it affects the end user because the database was slow and now this request failed. When we look at the data we collect here, that's for Java, for instance. For Java, we really see um, really code level visibility in APM tools. So we can really look, so operations guys really can look into the code, uh, what the, the, the developer wrote in, in the tool and see, oh, they, 
do so many database statements here, or they have a select star from something, so that's a problem. So they can really proactively look into the code. For Node.js, it looks currently like that. We see there is some gap in visibility in here. And the reason is that Node.js is so young that, and the, that Node.js runs, first it's young, and second it runs on a single thread. It's hard to stitch uh, one uh, st stitch request together, so I cannot create a CPU sample on a thread and find out that this is, belongs to one transaction. So you just see every transaction flying by there and you get so much data and you cannot find out, uh, correlate these two requests currently. That's the problem in Node.js and there is some remedy and I just want to show you that uh, on the end, it's called async wrap. And async wrap will allow it to subscribe to every callback in an application and do a real tracing through every callback, that, everything that's asynchronous in the application, you can really do tracing through it and lock this away. And there is this Google tracing, uh, this uh, node tracing working group that's actively working on solutions for that. And in the newest V8 engines, you even have uh, a tracing thread where you can pu push data to. And this will mean that we can, we soon can do real um, transactional tracing within Node.js with minimum performance impact, but that's still to come. It took its time until something like that was possible in Java, but Java is, I think, 22 years old, and Node.js was invented in 2009, and here we see some gap in yeah, functionality because it's so young. Takeaways from this talk, maybe. Node.js, if someone comes up and starts Node using Node.js in, in an existing company, it always introduces some kind of change. You can use dedicated tools like nSolid and everything I've, I've shown you if you really just want to monitor Node.js. You should always holistically think about the application and really, really protect your boundaries to other tiers of the whole application stack to really see if something is going on or if something is wrong. And you can use APM solutions like Dynatrace, Ruxit, App Dynamics, New Relic, whatever, to really get a holistic view of your whole application stack. That's it from me. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? One question. I'm terrible with, but I can try it. Uh, has any questions? So I don't have to throw the ball. I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> okay, thank you.